when you were speaking about Israel and its creation, I was reminded of the brilliant dramatization by Peter Kosminski, which you may um, have seen called The Promise. Yeah. But in any event, the, what strikes me is that surely one injustice cannot be corrected by another injustice. And if you are castigating what has happened many years ago with the creation of Israel, surely it is in the same vein incorrect to castigate or to condone in any way, which you have not, uh, the acts of terrorism taking place. My question is simply this. You talk about draining the swamp. In practical terms, how can one really achieve that in, in, in this day and age? And surely, surely you can see that moving out from the occupation of Iraq, incorrect as it may have been, will only embolden certain elements, and they will see that as a weakness of the West. How can that be handled strategically? Well, thank you for an elegant question. Let me deal with its components, Syriatum. It is precisely the addressing of one injustice with another injustice that the Palestinian people have suffered. We are told that Israel must exist because of the worst crime in human history, in my opinion, which was visited upon the Jewish people in Europe at the hands of European Christians calling themselves fascists or varieties of nationalists. We're told that in reparation somehow for that gigantic crime, Israel should be allowed to commit a crime against another people by taking their country, driving them out, and refusing to allow them to come back. It's precisely that that you say is unacceptable, which has in fact already happened. And we're told that the Palestinian people cannot be allowed to return, even though it is their eternal legal and eternal moral right to return to their homes. They cannot be allowed to do so because just demographically, the Jews in the state would become a minority and it would no longer be able to call itself, though I don't accept the nomenclature, the Jewish state. And so what you're actually asking me implicitly in your question to do is to allow, as it were, a third injustice to take place. The first being the suffering of the Jews in the Holocaust. The second being the Nakba, the catastrophe which expelled the Palestinian people in 1948 and beyond. And the third injustice of not allowing them to return to their homes. But I have a plan. And it's this, I myself do not believe in Jewish states or white states or black states. I only believe in democratic states. And the only solution here is for a binational state in that small territory called Israel-Palestine or Palestine-Israel, call it what you will, where all the Jews Christians and Muslims live as equal citizens under the law. One man, one woman, one vote. What's wrong with that? That's what we ask for everywhere else. It's what we insist upon for ourselves. When Mandela was freed from prison, the Boers asked him if they could have the orange free state as a white state. And Mandela answered, I don't believe in white states or black states, only democratic states. Well, if it was good enough for post-apartheid South Africa, why isn't it good enough as a solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict? Moreover, in your latter point, you seem to be saying, if I may say so, and we're coming up to the 100th anniversary of the First World War, what was the rubric of the big powers then? We're here because we were here. Because we were here. We can't leave because we're there. We can't leave 
because of all the people we've lost there already. We can't leave because who will guard the graves of those we have lost there already? This is the recipe for a First World War in perpetuity. People in trenches murdering each other in large numbers. If I take Afghanistan as an example, there are no Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan anymore. As a matter of fact, we are currently employing Al-Qaeda in Syria as we previously did in Libya. I know that's hard to believe, but it's a fact. Acknowledged by the US State Department itself, a flicker of Al-Qaeda, the head of the State Department called it. Six months ago, in the New York Times, almost every week, you will read reports of the growing concern in Washington at the presence of Al-Qaeda elements in Syria using Western money and arms to carry out their jihad there. And Al-Qaeda murdered the American ambassador to Libya in Benghazi just a few weeks ago. The very same Al-Qaeda that we and the US returned into power in Libya. So there's no Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. So why are we there? We went there to deal with bin Laden, whom we sent to Afghanistan in the first place. The only reason these jihadists were ever in Afghanistan is because we sent them there to fight the then Soviet Union and the then Red Army. We gave them everything with which to conduct their so-called holy war in Afghanistan throughout the 1980s. And you, I think, know this. So if there's no Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, why are we continuing to lose our own young men and burn our own practically non-existent treasure by apparently endless war in Afghanistan? Of course it'll be embarrassing for the politicians to have to leave Afghanistan having achieved none, precisely none, of the boasts that they made but what's better, embarrassed politicians or an endless stream of dead soldiers coming back and an endless expenditure of billions of pounds that we don't have? I know which I prefer. 